Good morning and thank you. Uh, my name is Beth Messick. I'm with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. I've been there almost 30 years. Uh, I'm the Digital Forensic Investigator Manager and I've been doing work in the Digital Forensics area for about the past 15 years. Um, recently we have opened a new unit, uh, the Georgia Cyber Crime Center unit. Uh, it is located in Augusta. There's a Georgia Cyber Center there. It just recently opened in July. We're really excited to be down there and I'll tell you a little bit about that and, and how that came about. And then we'll move on into the presentation about how to start a career, which we're hoping uh, some of you will be interested in and in getting in law enforcement with your cyber skills. So we'll go through that next. Uh, the Cyber Center started originally the forensics and is still located in the Child Exploitation and Computer Crimes Unit. And I know that's a strange name for a unit, but that is really where forensics and law enforcement evolve from. Most states evolve cyber units from their crimes against children uh, where there's a cyber nexus to it, the child pornography, child exploitations, those types of crimes. So they usually evolve from those units into a cyber crime unit. And the same is true for the GBI. So about a year and a half ago or so, uh, we were all meeting and talking and a state legislator came down and said, you know, what do we need to do about cybercrime in the state of Georgia? We said, well, we need a standalone unit just because it's, it's evolved so much from just from the crimes against children to really where any crime is going to have a digital nexus. Everyone has a cell phone with them or there, there may be something that they've done on their laptop or computer. You almost cannot go to a crime scene at this point and not find something digital in the area at that particular crime scene. And that's where we want to move with the cybercrime unit is so that we can educate first responders or we can educate investigators on how when you arrive at a scene, what do you need to look for other than fingerprints and the guns and the knives? What is something else that could possibly be at the scene that could aid your investigation? And the majority of the time there is going to be something digital that's there as well. It could be a DVR that's recorded video of what happened at the scene. It could be a vehicle. The person's vehicle may be storing data about where they were, where they were traveling. Uh, the cell phone, same thing. A lot of times the GPS locators or who, who was in the area when a particular crime occurred. Uh, they may have texted someone. They may, you know, Google a map on how to get to a particular location. There's so much information out there right now that we can use for a criminal investigation that it, it's really pushing forward and, it, and it's moving beyond just the uh, child exploitation area. So we uh, told them that we needed a, a standalone cybercrime unit and they did. They, they graciously, the governor decided to let us be in the Georgia Cyber Center. Uh, the building went up in a year. It was actually pretty amazing. He, uh, he said, if we can build a bridge this quickly, when, when the bridge was burned down, he said, then we can build a, a building this quickly, and it did go up in a year. So we've been there since July. We have four digital forensic investigators and two special agents and two supervisors in the unit at this time. We're hoping to expand. We have plenty of room in the building to expand, and we're looking to uh, possibly with future funding um, through the state be able to expand those positions. Another thing that when we presented this, we were talking about the backlog for the digital forensics area, how much, you know, we are behind, which obviously slows the courts down. It could slow an investigation down until we do our part to get it ready for court. So in addition to that, we're also just seeing the amount of money that is being lost in the state of Georgia through cyber crimes, be it um, electronic um, email compromise or different scams, uh, just different things that are, are affecting the state of Georgia's economy through cybercrime. So we wanted to make sure that we had covered that and that we were going to be able to look at it from a criminal perspective. So that's kind of where the Augusta cybercrime unit uh, came from. In that building with us as well is Augusta University. It's, it's a lot like uh, Chris was saying, we, we, you know, we're trying to cooperate. We've got Augusta University, Augusta Technical College, uh, law enforcement, and then other government and private industries all within this building. And that's really exciting for us. The way the building's designed, we are, there's common areas that we can all go and share information, share ideas, and get to know one another. So hopefully those that are in another area will be able to help us. If we have a question about an app, maybe there's an app that we've actually never used. There may be some students there that are familiar with that app. We just haven't used it. 
so they can educate us or they can do the research on the app so we'll know how to interpret the data if it does come up in a criminal investigation. So we're really excited about how the building is designed and how we're all coming together to hopefully all work on these cyber issues. Okay, so that's my spill for the cyber crime unit. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go today to talk a little bit about having a career in digital forensics. Right now what has happened is law enforcement, the investigators are being forced to become digital or cyber or computer people so that we can investigate these type crimes. What we like to see is a paradigm shift where we have persons that are interested in cyber and digital computers and make them to law enforcement. That's what we're hoping to kind of shift that paradigm of how, how we recruit and how we bring people in and shift people into these positions. Um, it used to be, especially with the crimes against children, you know, the guy that could fix the printer, you know, he was tagged as the person that we were going to use in that particular unit. So anything that had to do with the computer, if you know how to fix a printer, okay, that's going to be your new responsibility. So we're trying to shift that a little bit. And so when you're looking at your career and you're in cyber and you're in uh, different IT type careers, consider law enforcement because there's a lot of different ways that you can go with that. Um, there's analytical positions that you can do. There's a cyber analyst, not over in crime, only in crime, but in industry as well. There's, you could be an agent or an investigator on the state level, local or federal level. Uh, Fort Gordon is in Augusta and we're hoping to work with them very closely. I think the Cyber Excellence Center is in Fort Gordon. That's a great career if anybody wants to go that direction. Or uh, NSA is down in that area as well. So there's a lot of different things that you can do other than just, you know, work at a corporation and be a system administrator or, you know, something along that more traditional line. So kind of keep that in mind when you're um, studying and where, which direction you want to go. And definitely keep law enforcement in your, in your mind. Um, basically what we do, if you're in a corporation or something, you may know that corporation's system very well. You may know their operating system like the back of your hand. You may know how their whole network works. Well, if you're in law enforcement, you are forced. You never know what tomorrow is going to bring. So you may be looking at a whole different operating system, one you've never seen. Or you may be working, uh, you know, in an Apple environment one day. You may be working in a Linux environment the next day. You're going to be processing mobile devices and DVRs and with the Internet of Things, I mean, you may be looking at a Fitbit. There's so much stuff that's going to be out there. It's just really a, a challenge every day. It's not the same thing every day. There's no telling what you're going to face tomorrow. Uh, when you go out on a search warrant, you just do not know what you're going to walk into. So it is, it's, it's a fun. It's a fun career. It's a fun place to be. Um, in addition to that, it's rewarding. Um, again, kind of working with the uh, children victims. That's very rewarding to, to contribute to that area and try to help in those situations. Um, so do, you know, kind of think a little bit different from where, where the mainstream is of what you might be thinking in your career and consider law enforcement. And I guess I should have gone over this one first. Uh, what is the digital forensic? So it's actually the recovery of anything that's stored electronically. So if data is stored electronically, we will attempt to pull that data off of that device or either even process it on that dice, device and look at it for evidence that can be used in court. So that's what the digital forensics parts are. Anything that's data stored electronically that we can use, we can forensically retrieve that data, meaning that it's not going to be contaminated in any way. We don't change the evidence or do anything like that. Um, and then we can use it in a court. So basically, uh, right now we're just saying that the computer crime is going to be anything that uh, has that digital nexus to it. Right now, I mean, why would you go rob a bank, right? Why would you take a risk at walking into a bank with all these cameras on, you know, die packs are going to be in the money and all this different stuff? Why would you not do it on a computer? Why would you not try to scam someone out of you know, $15,000 with an email and you're just sitting there letting the computer do all the work for you. So that's what um, a lot of the cyber crime or the computer crime is based around stuff like that. Um, but there's also, like I said, there's evidence on these different devices that, that come up as well. So basically GBI, uh, 
a lot of people, I think, get confused. They think that we just are able to look at everything or that we're just seizing all this information. That's not true. There's a lot of legal process that goes into law enforcement and the different um, cases that we can work, the, what we can look at on a particular device. It's not, we just don't randomly go out there and, you know, grab a phone or, you know, get into your information and stuff like that. Um, so GBI is actually an assisting agency, and what that means is that a local police department has to ask us to help them with a the case. There's only a couple of different crime types that we have original jurisdiction for, and that is the crimes against children, drug cases, and, and uh, corruption. Anything else, a local police department or sheriff's office has to ask the GBI to become involved. Um, and once we do that, and then generally speaking, either they would write the search warrant or we would write the search warrant uh, with probable cause of why we believe this particular device or why we believe this particular data has anything to do with that particular crime. And we're only looking for stuff that's specific to that crime. We're not just randomly looking at everything on a device. It's something that's specific in the search warrant. Um, so we go ahead and with legal process, saying that you can seize the device and then search it, then we use specialized software either at the lab or on the scene to retrieve the data. Um, the software actually parses the data out for us and analyzes it, creates different patterns and so forth like that. And then lastly, and the most, and honestly, I feel like this is one of the most important things that we do is we document. So again, when you're going through classes and you're going through your different um, studying, Always remember, we need you to be able to communicate, both oral and written. That is so important because if you can't communicate what it is that you have found on a device, you're not, it's not helping anyone or anybody. So just make sure that you are clear in your documentation, in your writing skills, in your speaking skills, in the way that you explain things, the way you articulate. Because we have to go before a jury. We have to actually go before the investigator to start with. They probably don't know what we're talking about. So we need to be able to explain this to them in a clear way. And another thing is, if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. That's true in law enforcement. It, almost anything, if you don't write it down, it just basically almost is to the point it didn't happen. Uh, so they, we stress that every step that you take needs to be documented in written format. Um, and then once we present this to a to a, an investigator, then they may want to move on to the prosecutor. And you may never actually talk to the prosecutor. They're simply relying on your report to be clear enough to explain why we believe this person uh, should go to jail for whatever it is that they're being alleged to have um, be involved in. So the documentation is very important. I always stress that with everybody. I need everybody to be able to clearly write and explain. Um, and another thing, you know, in a jury, you may have your grandmother on the jury. You don't know. You may have a Georgia Tech professor, and you may have somebody that all they do is use a flip phone. So you've got to be able to work with all of that audience when you're presenting your information. Okay, so the nuts and bolts of what we do, uh, the first phrase of digital forensics is to acquire the information. Uh, there, we usually use a write blocker, which means that there's not going to be anything written to the original evidence. Forensics is changing over time because they're, with a cell phone, we have to turn the phone on in order to retrieve the data. Again, you just need to document the date and time and what you did. When you're doing a memory analysis, you're, you're pulling that data straight out of there. We're not able to turn off the machine and freeze that uh, device in time. So... Um, Acquiring is a big part because once we do that, it's considered the original evidence and we work off of whatever it is that we have acquired. And that's considered the evidence from that point forward. Second, we analyze the data and we'll talk about that a little bit more, the different software we use and how it parses it out. And then again, like I said, the reporting side. So again, we we're, we're do look to almost retrieve anything. If we can pull data off of it, that's the best case scenario, is just to go ahead and pull it off. Uh, a big problem that we have right now, though, is storing the data that we pull off because there's so much data out there. I, I mean, a laptop from Dell selling off the shelf with, what, a terabyte or more? That's just standard. Uh, so you consider we go out, say there's four adults in a house, each of them has a laptop, that may be four terabytes of data. Or if we uh, acquire a server, there, I mean, 
we have servers with you know 72 terabytes. There's they're they're massive. So um, how we acquire that data, how we store it, that's a big thing for us in making the decisions as to what we're going to preserve and keep. Uh, another thing in um, a big thing in forensics is that you can. You got a question. No, we don't. We only do digital, um, zeros and ones, you know, bits and bytes. We're, we're strictly there. We're not on the analog level. Uh, that's a whole other <laughs> group that, that we're not involved with. Um, so anyway, you, you need to be able to restore data because the defense has got, the, you know, that's part of our criminal justice system. They have as much right to the information as we did. So they've got to be able to go back in and completely recreate what we did or we can show them what we did so we have to be able to restore um, everything that we that we pr presented so this is just basically um, one of our workstations again we, we pulled the hard drive here and connected it to a write blocker so there's no writes being made back to the original evidence we're not putting evidence on there ourselves we're not adding anything that strictly uh, what we pulled out of a suspect's either laptop or desktop or wherever the particular hard drive is located. Um, and then we use the working copy is what we actually work off of. And then that would be stored in the evidence room. We'd put it back in the computer and we would store that in the evidence room. Um, that's a big thing for law enforcement is chain of custody. Just because you don't want to, the, you're, if you're alleged to have committed a crime, you don't want anyone else to have uh, touched the different evidence. So we have a really good way of uh, keeping up with this chain of evidence. Uh huh. When, when y'all actually have drives that are, that are rated, so they're, you know, the data is dropped across them, do y'all capture each drive independently and then take the images and re reconstruct the rate? Or how, how do y'all handle drives that are, the data is across multiple drives? If we do a live image, we can pull it straight off okay. the way it is, which is usually the less complicated way to do it. If we can, can go out and pull it while the machine is live and pull that data straight out of it, that's a good way. If not, there is software that will recreate the RAID. It's, it's not always foolproof. It doesn't always completely work. So like I said, best case scenario is to try to pull that data while it's still in its environment, its home environment, so we can get a good clear. But there is software that you can use that will recreate it, but it's always a little shaky if it's oh, going to yeah. do it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, with your working copy, what kind of like, I know you have a chain of custody, but what kind of like, um, do you have any specific processes you like to use to make sure that the working copies aren't also, um, I guess, there's, there's, there would be no question right. as to that. Being there are right. the, uh, the images themselves are hashed at the end. Okay. Um, the software that we use creates a hash, uh, which is basically an algorithm of the, the binary or the, the bytes and bits where it creates a, a new digital number that means that this is the exact image of the original evidence. And there's actually a couple steps if, if you read guidance software along the way, because they make EO1 files, there may be 50 to 60 EO1 files, and each of those EO1 files has a hash value, and then the entire image has a hash value. So your working copy should match your original hash. Every blue moon, there is like a software glitch, I'm not a software, a hardware glitch, or you know, a sector may go bad and it makes a little glitch in there, but usually the software will report that to you. Uh -huh. I was just gonna ask, how big is your team and how many investigations do you have running you know, simultaneously? We have eight uh, digital forensic investigators in the Child Exploitation and Computer Crime Unit indicator. There are four digital forensic investigators, like I said, that started in July in Augusta. So we'll have a total of 12. Um, we haven't completely decided how we're going to split this up, but probably geographically more so than anything, where the Atlanta group will take two thirds of the state and the Augusta will take a third of the state just because it breaks up that easy. We'll probably be coastal side, east side, 
of the state for Augusta. Um, one of the reasons being is with child exploitation, there's a real big mental health concern that if you continuously, <coughs> excuse me, only view child pornography images, that it, it's a mental health concern. So we need to make sure that we are giving those guys a really good break from just doing that and you looking at other types of crimes as well. Not to mention, they have a lot of skill set in that unit that's gonna take time to develop in the Augusta unit. Uh, we've got some networking experts, we have some uh, MAC experts, we have DVR experts. They've always, that unit's been around a long time and they've been trained in a lot of areas, so we need to make a good blend of the two. Uh -huh. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is just try to determine uh, what type case it is, because there are different strategies on how you approach different type cases. Um, if it's fraud, you may be looking for Excel spreadsheets. Like I said, you know, your, your search warrant is going to limit your scope as to what it is that you're looking for. If it's a, a credit card fraud, you know, there's different patterns that you can look at. The American Express uses a particular pattern for their credit cards. A Visa uses a particular pattern. So we would put in for a pattern search for those particular numbers if it was a credit card fraud. Uh, we might look for um, this identity theft. We had a, actually had a case, I think it was up at Georgia Tech, where the, he was making fake IDs. So um, we found numerous pictures of people standing in front of a blue screen, you know, getting their picture made. So it just depends on what type of case it is as to what it is that we're looking for as to how we're going to go about searching the particular um, data in the device. A lot of times, especially now, like I said, um, People search so much um, through the internet that we look for internet history a lot. And that's not, you know, in check fraud or if you're a counterfeit, you know, printing money, you're using the actual computer to print the money. Well, if it's a homicide case, you're not gonna beat someone over the head with their laptop, right? So there's gonna be other evidence in there where you do, <laughs> or you could, <laughs> it's possible. Um, where you've gone in and searched different things, like I said, or you've looked for, you know, you look for a location. Um, we had a, I think it was over in Germany, where the health app on the Apple was showing that this guy, the particular time that they felt like the homicide had occurred, his heart rate had increased, and, and he was showing like he was going up and down stairs. Well, it turned out he was going down a bank, up and down a bank, um, where he had dropped the body off, somewhere like that. So his health activity was showing that increased activity during that time period. So there's a lot of things that we can use uh, that are digitally that can become part of the case without being the actual weapon or something like that. People, like I said, they panic. We had another case in a, where a guy text mess, I'm sorry. I have a quick question. Uh -huh. We, we subpoena those age, those companies. And they'll, so they have all that history somewhere? Somewhere, yes they do. <laughs> um, there's different things that different providers store, such as Google or Yahoo or Facebook or Twitter. I, I don't know if they're mandated by law as to what they keep. I know some of them, like ISPs, are mandated by law to report child pornography on their network. Um, that's another reason that we're having to train and a reason for this type of unit is to train these investigators because Google wants particular language in their subpoenas because if you don't use the right wording, they don't provide you that information. So it's important for us to get the word out if a person needs, has a case that's related to something at Google or something at Facebook, they need to know how to ask that corporation or that social media what it is that they you know want what's the data they want because and we had a meeting with facebook and google and a couple of people uh at the cybercrime conference and, you know and they're not trying purposely to not accommodate law enforcement but you have to consider facebook is a worldwide company google is worldwide they're getting request every day, you know, hundreds, like 200 requests a day for something that they have. And as they told us, it's not, you know, you just hit one button and all this data just appears. So there's a lot of work that goes into it for them as well. 
So that's kind of where, like I said, we need to educate people on how to subpoena, what to subpoena, what kind of information do they have? Because like I said, we, I, we've met with Google. So they said, this is what you need to ask for. And we need to provide that information to everybody because they can't meet with every you know, law enforcement agency across the country. They try and they, they, they do you know, different seminars and so forth, but we really need to get out there and educate other persons on how to subpoena that type of information. And if you have an exigent circumstance, if you have, um, I think like uh, it was after the Parkland shooting in Florida, there's a lot of copycat threats on social media, right? And we all know that story that the threat was out there. So like that weekend, there was a lot of threats out on the internet and Google was literally answering the phone that day. That's how many requests they were getting that weekend about things that were happening, threats that were being made on social media because they really wanted to be able to respond because of the activity that had happened. But we need to be able to provide people with that information. When you have this situation where you have a, a threat on a social media, how do you get a hold of the right person to get the information that you need? And that's where I feel like our unit as a statewide agency can assist. We can't work every case, but we can say, okay, here's a template of what you need to send. Here's the, the phone number of the person you need to call right here, right now. So um, that, again, is, I feel like, part of what we're doing. So what level of cooperation is there across all the states? A lot. What level of sophistication are the different states at in comparison? We, we are one of the newer states as far as creating a cybercrime unit. There have been several that have been doing it for years, uh, and there's some that do not have them. Uh, like I said, I, I'm a participant in the ICAC unit and the cybercrime unit, and you'll cross see people there. Uh, again, it's, it evolves from there. But the cybercrime units are taking ground, and we're having <coughs> excuse me, more committees. They're through the... Um, <coughs> Excuse me, the State Criminal Investigators Associate, Association, Asia, um, where they all come together. There is a cybercrime committee there, and it's the different heads of the agencies who pass it down to someone at my level or higher that say, we, you know, we need to get on board with this and we need to do that. There's a lot of corporate, I mean, as far as cooperating with each other, there, there's a lot. Even in the federal level, we, we work with the FBI, we work with Secret Service, we work with a lot of federal agencies. There's no real competition here. Um, I think sometimes you hear that law enforcement is competitive, but usually that's because there's money involved. Um, so if they're seizing assets, it does get a little competitive because somebody's getting money. Uh, in this world, it's, it's not. In the crimes against children, you're focused on victims. You're focused on that. So it's not, um, there's not a lot of issues between the different law enforcement agencies, which is nice. Anybody else? Um, okay, so anyway, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of crimes that we can look at. Um, and then you've got to figure out what's relevant to your case. Is it, is it an image? Is it a date and time? You know, is somebody trying to use their computer as an alibi? We get that all the time. People try to use, oh, I was, you know, at my house sending an email when this happened, you know, or I was at this location. Again, we're looking to get into vehicle forensics. And a lot of times, you know, that doesn't lie. Or if your phone pings a cell tower, you were within that proximity of what of that cell tower when that happened. So there's a lot of stuff on the cyber line, you know, that it can either help you and say, yes, I was truly at this location because there's no question you were at a particular location if you, if you pinged a cell phone. And then again, if you're trying to look like you were somewhere else and your cell phone pinged over here, then it's pretty clear that the cell phone tower doesn't make a mistake there. Um, so it goes both ways and, you know, we certainly don't want to, if someone's innocent, you know, go ahead, eliminate that person and move on to the next. We don't have time to sit there and just, you know, beat a dead horse. So if, you, if there's something that we can use that, to eliminate a person, then let's go ahead and do that. Uh, the hash values, I was talking about that. We do use those a lot. Um, you can get a hash value on a file. So if we have a particular picture that we're looking for, a lot of times, uh, say a man has 
ask a young girl to send an inappropriate picture of herself to him, we can find the hash value of the image that she sent, and then we'll be able to uh, recognize that, use the hash value to look on their device and specifically find that particular image really fast, just like that. So hash values are really important. Um, especially when you're looking at images, there's a new process called DNA photos that they're using right now. Microsoft developed that where a lot of times, especially with child pornography, they may change one or two pixel and that will change the hash value on a, on a file if you change the pixel. So DNA uh, photo segments the photo itself and creates the hash just on a grid of the photo. So if you change a pixel in one or two of the segments, it will pick up on the remaining part of the image and still zero in on that particular file. So uh, that's really good technology with us. Again, you know, it's always a, a thing, you know, we, we take one step forward, bad guy takes step forward. We take one step forward, bad guy takes one step forward. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, again, you know, in your career and where you're good at, if you can <laughs> develop stuff like that, that helps. That, that's certainly a good thing for us. Uh, somebody had to think of that, you know. We know that they changed pixels. We knew they were doing that in order to throw off the hash values. They, they know what we're doing. We know what they're doing, but somebody had to develop something to stay one step ahead of them. Same thing with encryption, we, with the uh, Apple encryptions. It's just a chess game that goes back and forth, back and forth. They'll, they'll figure out encryption. We'll get somebody that figures out how to get around it. They'll close that loophole. Somebody will figure out how to get around that loophole. So we're always looking to, to bring in that gap a little bit. Um, and there's a lot of money there if you can figure that stuff out. So don't, don't be surprised on that. Okay, so um, the different kind of information that we look at is chats, uh, communication is real big. We look at a lot of that stuff, Messenger, uh, Kick is an app that we look at. Um, I don't know. There's, there's a ton of them out there, and that's what I'm saying. It's hard for us to know. Just as soon as we think we get a handle on one, or we, we have a good relationship with that company, Kick is actually out of Canada. We finally got some good communication, some good working uh, relationships with Kick, and somebody will, they'll start using something else. Um, so it's just always like this, kind of this chess game of what people are using, what law enforcement's good at tracking and getting information from before somebody moves on to something else. Dates and times are weird. Uh, on computers, it's very, very easy to change a date and time on a computer. So if you can stay away from that, it's better. But there's some times that you just can't, or like, like saying with a cell phone um, tower, their, their dates and times are going to be correct. DVRs are the worst. They never have the right time. Nobody sets a clock on a DVR. So if you're ever out on a DVR, you know, you might as well figure out what the time is on that camera and what time it truly is, because you're going to have to, you know, accommodate those hours that are wrong. Um, people say, what happened on such and such date at this particular time? We're going like, this is like 2015. You're not even close on here. We don't, you know, so we have to go through everything. Um, <clears throat> event logs are big for networking. Except internet artifacts are everywhere. There's a ton of that stuff out there. Metadata <clears throat> on uh, different files. I love recent files. People don't think about that. Y'all know I'm talking about the recent files. Like you hit Word and it comes up the last 10 that you looked at. They'll say, oh, I never, I didn't look at this. We're like, it's in your recent file. <laughs> you just did this. Um, registry information. Um, sometimes we have people that do anti-forensics like CC Cleaner. We used to have one called Evidence Eliminator. Uh, I love it when they use that. That's like tell a jury they had evidence eliminator software on their computers like you know why else would you have that sometimes it does a good job and sometimes it doesn't a lot of them do not clean out the registry a lot of those type uh, softwares will clean out your internet histories that may do something else in your unallocated space but a lot of times they don't get into the registry and we find and actually the registry is where those recent files are stored so even if you think you got rid of it it's still there. Um, we actually had a police officer one time who thought he was 
super smart, and he, he was to a point, but um, even went as far as to go to court because he really thought he had done a great job and he hadn't. We found, found stuff. Uh, an allocated is just going to be basically where your deleted information is located. The way that hardware is storing now is a little bit more difficult to retrieve an allocated because it erases differently or wipes, erase is a bad word, it wipes the data different than it used to under the NTFS or under the FAT system. So it's a little bit harder for us to come about, but the good news is, uh, is these drives are so large that a lot of that data is staying there before it actually wipes. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I talked about the reporting a little bit. Um, again, I can't say enough about the reports because if you don't write it down, again, it just didn't happen. And we generally don't go to court. If you go to court, it's going to be two to three years, if you're lucky, when this particular case goes to court. And you need to be able to, you've probably worked 100 cases between that case and when this, when you have to go to testify in court about that particular case. So you need a really good report just to tell, remind yourself of what you did. I mean, we have processes that are consistent, but there are individual cases that are worked different ways. Uh -huh. So with 12 investigators, and to your point that it takes so long for somebody to process the courts, how do you actually like store evidence on that scale four years up to the court day, or do you actually turn it back over to the authorities that are actually doing the investigation and entrust them with that data? We, uh, we do turn it back over. The, the laptop itself, the computer itself, that is original evidence. And like I said, we should be able to go back and recreate that case exactly as we did the first time. Um, so the laptop sat in an evidence room for four years and we re-image it, the hash value should, should match the exact same one that we used. So we rely on those local agencies. No, we do not have enough space to store all this stuff. And we don't even really have enough space to store the images. Like I was telling you, I mean, we have like, I don't know, I think that's 72 terabytes in Atlanta, maybe 150 in Augusta. But you get a really big case, and it's going to take up a lot of your space. So um, we have to be able to, to say we can go back and recreate that exactly like we did before. And we do trust the locals. There, I mean, there's just, generally speaking, I haven't ever had a case that fell apart because of some type of evidence issue. And do you all have a legal team that actually tells you when you actually can ultimately destroy the evidence? So like when the case is closed? A judge. Okay, so a judge is actually... A judge will issue a destruction order. Okay. Yeah. So we, no, we do not just say, you know what, you know, we, I mean, there's an appeal process. There's a big legal process that goes through, and then the judge will issue this destroy um, order, and then we actually have two people sign off on it as it's being destroyed. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about a little, a couple of cases. Uh, this is a really good case, um, Laura Giddens. It was actually on like a 2020 or 60 minute. Anybody see that show on this particular case? It was in Mercer. She was a Mercer graduate student. It's only maybe, um, it's not 10 years old even. It's a pretty recent case. Um, so this is our uh, suspect, Stephen McDaniel. I don't think this is the one we're playing. Oh, I don't have the audio set up, do I? Okay, basically what he's doing here is um, he was her neighbor. Okay, what happened is Lauren um, lived in an apartment complex. She was getting ready to graduate. She was moving about the next day, about the next week. He is a neighbor um, at the apartment complex. And the, she goes missing, right? Uh, so the couple of them, including him, went into the apartment. Her keys are still there. Very much. Okay. And, um, she just recently graduated. Oops, hang on. Let me see if I can back it up. Yeah, Long was my neighbor. Yeah, Long was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and 
So he's right there, he's trying to establish her alibi. I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've always seen a noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer? Yeah, she and I were, we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you, what did you see? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies you might have had, somebody that might have hurt her? No, I mean, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key, we went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss, but I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. And the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. What about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Um, I think. Had you heard it? Had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? Uh, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they still got a body there earlier. We don't know if this is the same person or not. So I thought we were going to ask people if they know who lived there. So he just realized they found the body. He, the reporter told him they had located the body. And as you heard, he's saying uh, she sent an email. He mentions a door jam in there. So he's talking about different things. So he doesn't think, he thinks he's disposed of the body very well. And the reporter just says they found it. And that's where he's saying, you know, all life flushes out of his face and he needs to sit down. I think she thought it's because it was a friend of his, but he's actually um, having, a bad, having a bad day right there. So, um, like I said, one of the things that you heard him mention was that there was a door brace beside the door. So no one, you know, could have broke in. So when we're going through, and we actually work really close with the investigator on this particular case because when they were interviewing, and, and again, that's another thing you gotta do, you got to work with your investigators because you never know this. You can see here, he's searching for door brace. Why would you do that, right? Why would you be searching for door brace? And this is another way that it was parsed out. And he's, what he's trying to do is figure out how to, how to beat that door brace system. Just to give you a background on the story of what actually happened, and um, one, of the, one of Lauren's friends told an investigator, she said she thought someone had been in her apartment before. Um, that was kind of hearsay, you know, but they felt like she just felt like she, someone had been in her apartment for some reason. And that's why she got the door jam, is because she had felt like somebody had been in her apartment. Well, fact is, he had actually been in her apartment before, and when she puts this door jam up, he can't get in anymore, so he's trying to figure out how to uh, get around it. Um, so let me pause this if I can. So this is actually a video that we found on his camera. What he's doing is he's ran, put the camera on the pool, ran it up inside the apartment, and he's looking her apartment at that door jam. It's hard to see over there, but you can see over there. So that's the kind of stuff that, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, another thing that he did, and you can ask me. Oh, when was this case again? 
It wasn't very long ago. I can't remember. Did he use like a drone? No, he put a camera on a pole, taped it to the pole and went up the side and just used it up there. No, it wasn't a drone or anything. It was only like a second story. And he, he just basically ran the camera up and did that. Another thing he was searching in there, uh, not to be too gross, but he cut the body up because he couldn't, I don't, well, I don't think he was a big enough guy to carry her down the stairs. So he had actually cut the body up in the bathtub. Um, and then he disposed of her torso in the trash. Well, he Googled when the trash company came and picked up. So we see, I don't think I have a copy of it right here, but in his internet searches, he either called, but he was looking up that trash company to figure out when they came. Well, there's no reason he, I mean, he puts his trash in a dumpster. Why would he care, you know, when they, when they pick up? He's not making payments to them. There's no reason for him to have actually been out on that particular website. So he thought that they were coming, and that's what happened when that reporter was there. The dumpster people that come and pick up the trash dumpster, a police car was actually blocking the dumpster, and the trash guy said, you know what, you guys do what you're doing, we'll come back later. And uh, so the trash company left without emptying the dumpster, and that's when they were able to locate um, her torso into, in the trash can, and that's where he got the shock of his life is when they recovered that part of the body, and he was actually on camera when they did that. I know that's a hard story, uh, it's, it's, it's disturbing. You know, there's always a victim, like I said, if, if you want to help out in victims in situations, it's a good place to be. Um, so that's the rewarding part of it. Like I said, it is disturbing. It was a disturbing story. He's disturbing. Um, so that's the kind of stuff though that we, we did become involved in. And that's the kind of evidence that we are able to retrieve. Um, there was more stuff to it, but that's really kind of the really interesting stuff. I don't, yeah, we won't, we'll just go through this. Okay, so mobile devices. So there's different types of things that we can uh, look at, and, and mobile devices, the good thing about mobile devices, with a laptop or a computer when you walked into a house, it could be in a common area, right? So if you have a roommate type situation, or there's several people living in a house, and there's a laptop sitting out maybe on the kitchen table or in the dining room or something, chances are the defense for that particular person is gonna be, it wasn't me, someone else in the house did it. And you'd be shocked how many times people will blame other family members to be the one that has done something. But anyway, so it's, it's kind of hard sometimes and we can never say that someone was actually sitting um, at the keyboard. I mean, unless you physically see a person at a keyboard, I could never testify to that. So there's other things that we have to do uh, with the data that relates to that person. Um, you know, we could check their work schedule. Were they the only person, you know, were they off that day? You know, was everybody else in school or at work on a particular, that's when that date and time kind of comes into play. Um, so anyway, the good news about a mobile device is most people, you don't share your cell phone, right? You don't usually hand your phone off to your roommate or to whoever and just say, hey, you know what, use my phone for whatever you want to do. Um, so they're very personal. So it's a lot easier for us to, to express to a jury that chances are whatever happened on that cell phone was you because it's just not common practice that people hand off their cell phone, especially for any length of time. You may do one little search on it, you know, but you're not handing your phone off for two days or you know, while you're at work, your roommate doesn't have your cell phone. So that's the good news for us as far as mobile devices. Number two is it's tons of information. Every, you know, our lives are on those phones, um, which is making the courts very nervous because there's always that privacy issue. Um, and, Google, and Apple, you know, that's what they're saying. There's they're, they're so much about privacy. They're saying there's so much on those phones, and that's why they're encrypting so much. Um, encryption is a big deal for us. Sometimes we'll hold phones. Again, law enforcement's very, very patient. You ever heard long arm of the law? We can sit there, we can put a phone in evidence for three years and wait till somebody figures out how to beat, to beat that encryption. Three years from now, we may have the technology and we're doing it. We're, we're picking up phones right now from 2014 that we couldn't get into, we can get into them now. 
And if there's no, um, I just drew a blank. Um, if, if there's no time limit on that particular crime, then we can go back and use that information. So it's, it's a waiting game, it's a playing game. Um, same thing with like Tor, anonymizers, uh, dark web. We're really learning a lot about that stuff. Again, law enforcement is patient. So somebody may be using Tor, you know, it's just like, even in the old days, you know, somebody, they'll mess up. You'll forget at some point and you'll come out of the dark web and we may be sitting there just kind of waiting to see how you use your data when you come out from under there. So anyway, just know that this program is like, oh, you know, this has shut us down. There's Tor. We'll never be able to figure this stuff out. But um, it's kind of like everybody else. People try to, you know, they may hide. A fugitive may be gone for six or seven years, but they'll make a mistake and they'll either use their real name somewhere, they'll call somebody, or they'll use their social security number. And when you do, it just pops up and you're there. It's not much different for cyber either. Uh, we just have to be patient with it and just know that people will eventually make a mistake, they'll come out, and then we have to be ready for that. So yes, passwords, encryptions, it's all a big deal, but sometimes we're just gonna have to be a little more patient. Uh, one thing that we have to do for sure is isolate the network. We all know you can remotely wipe. Um, just document and report your findings. It's just a picture. Again, uh, we're real careful about how you document. Um, I had a, a case where a man gave a young girl a cell phone. We bought them together, right? There was one number different on that serial number. And we were processing both phones. So again, that attention to detail, making proper documentation about exactly what's going on is so important. Um, again, we, we document everything through evidence and you know, you, you can't refer to it as, you know, the red phone or, you know, the LG or the, you know, this phone. They were, they looked exactly the same and were the same except for one number. We use the Faraday box um, to isolate things from the network. Nothing can get in. You can, you stick your hands in the little gloves right there and, I mean, you know, can work on the screens or whatever to put it in airplane mode or whatever you need to do with that. There's a company out there now that we use, it's called Celebrite, and uh, you, if you follow this stuff at all on the news, it's a, it's a very big comp corporation. They're based out of Israel, but what they originally did is Celebrite was the company, when you went to Verizon or wherever you're, who are your cell phone carrier was, and you had old phone, and you just bought latest, greatest, newest phone. Well, old phone had data had to transfer to new phone, right? You wanted all your contacts in the right place. You wanted all your images. You wanted your text messages. Everything had to show up on that new phone exactly like it was in the right place from old phone. Well, Celebrite was the company that developed that technology that took old phone to new phone. So in order to do that, they have to know the file system of old phone, file system of new phone, so that they can put the data there. Well, what we realized is, well, if you can put it to a phone, you can just put it to a, to a file system and just let us analyze the data. So Celebrite has made a ton of money because people like Motorola, Apple, LG, whoever manufactures cell phones, they would tell Celebrite that file system structure or how this fits in, how to make that happen. Well, we all know how proprietary that data is, how secretive they are of that. Well, they gave it, they had to give it to somebody because they got to get that data over, right? Well, Celebrite's the company they gave it to and now law enforcement pays for that technology from Celebrite so that we can get it old phone to a file system and then parse it out and analyze it. So that's basically how that works. Um, again, it's a huge corporation, lots of money. It's a very expensive technology. They have to know, I mean, if you've got a victim, an elderly victim, and they've got a flip phone, we need to get that data. And they have to have the cables, they have to have the technology, the software, and everything to get that data out as much as they possibly can. So it's a, it's a very expensive, it's expensive training. Um, they're doing the password cracking right now too. Again, I was, I've heard they've got like 
200 research and development people constantly working on breaking encryption stuff. So they're, they're, it's a big company in a, in a big thing that they're doing. Uh, but it is expensive. Again, we have cables for every phone you could possibly, hopefully, come up with. And like I said, the day that the iPhone 10 came out, we had to be ready. They had to be ready, we had to be ready, because it could be relevant, I and mean, it could be relevant to a terrorism attack. You know, what if somebody went and bought that new phone two days ahead of time and used that phone somehow to, to commit an act? So we gotta be ready for that stuff. They're getting larger and larger. What's that ad right now where he's, where he's photographing that little robot thing that says he's like a terabyte on that phone? I almost threw up when I saw that. I was like, oh, you're killing us. No, don't do that. Um, so anyway, you know, even with cell phones, the, the amount of storage on there is unbelievable. It, it's a lot. There's little techniques right there. So if we can jump a phone off, almost like you do your car, so if there's an issue with the battery, we've got some technology to do that. We can pull data straight off of a chip uh, that used to be, that it's almost becoming irrelevant now because it's encrypted on the chip. The software, when we're pulling it, it's still encrypted. Before, we could get it off, the, off of the chip and it wasn't encrypted. It was through a software in the device itself, but now they're encrypting on the chip, so that's not as relevant as it used to be. And then we can do a chip off too where you solder and some other things. There are other options other than just Celebrite. Um, and we have actually tried, you know, where you have to take a picture. Actually, in that Faraday box is a video. But I'm just telling you, if you have to sit there and just imagine how much you're on your phone, how many text messages you sent, and if somebody has to manually go through that and try to find something, it is painful, very, very painful to do. So uh, that would be absolute last resort would be to photograph a message of some type. That's the actual Celebrite. It's very small. Um, this is actually military grade. I believe you could drop that thing out of an airplane and it wouldn't break. So um, they're real durable. We take them out on scenes with us. So there's different types of ways that you can uh, do your passwords. This was where um, one of my DFIs use facial recognition to, um, sorry, I'll wrap this up. Um, she went on Facebook, which is open source, right? He didn't block anybody from looking at his, his uh, Facebook. So they were able to get a straight on shot with him. And um, you can see here, did you see how she made him blink? She used a GIF and made him blink and it opened the phone. <laughs> That's just, I'm just, this is just me saying yay for us where we actually made that work. It's very hard to do, it took her a lot of attempts to do it, but um, eventually it, the cell phone did recognize it. Um, as you know, you have to blink, because we always thought, you know, a lot of times we have victims, they're, they're deceased, right? So, I mean, even they can't, we can't pull that uh, passcode out of their head. They're, they're not, no longer there. So we thought, oh, we'll have facial, you know, facial recognition. We'll just, you know, hold it up to the body and open the phone. And, uh, but the blink part was such a hard thing to do um, when you're doing that. So, but even um, in order to get a thumb print, there's a lot of legal issues right now as far as compelling people to give up their thumb print in order to open up their phone. It's kind of along the same line, like they can make you give up blood, but they can't make you talk. So, I don't know, there's, there, it's an interesting read if you ever want to go into looking at that stuff. There's a lot of different um, legal stuff that goes along with what we do. So this is our lab uh, in Atlanta. That was the JTAG that I was telling you about where we can solder different wires in on the phone to actually pull the data from that. So we do have a lot of advanced training. Um, we have some, some that's just law enforcement related. There are some that um, 
is very basic. It gets down to, you know, FAT 12, how to recover from there, how to testify in court. Uh, like I said, the, the latest and greatest iPhone information, we need to know how to do that as well. So there's a lot of training that goes along with it. Um, so if that's something you enjoy, because you have to keep up with that technology, we cannot, if we, are, if we stop, then we're just dead in the water. So we have to keep everybody trained and up to date on the latest technology out there. So if that's something you want, I don't know how corporations always hear that they're not as willing to provide training. Uh, law enforcement, that is something that we do. Almost at every level, we do provide a lot of training. So if research and continuing your education and staying up with things that interest you, then you might want to consider law enforcement. That's an evidence room. So that's what I'm saying. We see everything that comes through here. The case um, on the far side, that was one case. And that's what I'm telling you when we, I think there's there maybe 25 different devices that were in there. You can see a lot of the um, desktops and then there were just stuff. Um, so that's what I'm telling you when, there, when there's a storage issue or when we have to go through that much data. Um, and we have to, you know, just decide, you know, what, what, you know, where do we even start? Which one am I going to pick out of that? Which one do I think is going to, you know, you almost have to be a hocus pocus. You almost have a magic ball. So anyway, you just have to go through every one of those devices in order to make sure that you've got all the evidence that you need. Again, we go out on search warrants. Uh, it's Jake and Chris. We have the, take, the equipment we can take out with us on scene, especially, um, especially in child pornography type cases when the investigator is doing an interview and the forensics person is on site and we're either texting or talking back with the investigator and say, you know, we found X number of images right here on this laptop that was in your bedroom. We get a confession rate of about 85 to 90% when we are able to say right there on the scene that we have located the evidence that we need. We do a lot in the community in education. Um, again, this is with our Crimes Against Children. They go out to different schools and try to educate younger students and adults as well, you know, not how to not be a victim of a scam or, you know, this person, he may look like Justin Bieber, but he is not Justin Bieber. Do not send him your picture. Um, you know, how not to be vulnerable to these different things. Um, so that a lot of it is community interaction and education. The other picture is um, a lot of locals are in there, GBI is in there, where we all work together very well. Um, there's just no reason not to at this point. There's just too much out there not to work. We're fun. <laughs> Come work with us. Uh, you need a four-year degree. We do have a background check. Um, so if you want to become familiar with that, there are dis, uh, disqualifiers. If you go to GBI website, you'll see what a disqualifier is. Um, and then we start about 47.5. And uh, so go to our website if you're ever interested in a career at GBI. Okay, we, I've already done this, so. Is there any questions? Uh-huh. Ben, you mentioned, or I thought you touched on, on automobile performance. Uh-huh. And you, like, just touched on it just for a second. I was just wondering, like, how are y'all evolving in that space? Because I know, like, my new Civic, like, collects an immense amount of data about where it's been and, like, speed and telemetry data. So I was wondering, like, how are y'all growing into that field? We're actually sending the, the guys that are in Augusta are going to training in November. Uh, they will go in and basically retrieve that chip, and then the software will parse out that data much like a cell phone. You know, they'll, they know which particular models of which cars, how to parse out that data. And um, depending on what the search is, what we're looking for, are we looking for location? Are we looking for, um, location I think is gonna be really big for the vehicles. I mean, what we do, I don't care how fast you're going. I mean, whatever. Um, they may care in a vehicle accident. If it's a vehicle accident reconstruction, they may be interested in your speed or something like that. Um, we were looking at a case not long ago where it was a, there was a death. It was a, it was a vehicle homicide, um, accidental, obviously, um, on the girl's part, where they were trying to determine if she was on the phone or not. 
so they were looking at a lot of different things in that. Um, it just got to down to like four seconds, you know, and it was really almost just too much that we couldn't clearly say that that's what had happened because the time was just so instantaneous right there that we weren't able to do it. But there were different things in the car that they were looking at trying to make that. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I want to know more about, you know, what we're going to do. Um, but I believe we're just going to go to the vehicle wherever it's been impounded, pull the data, and then bring it back and try to analyze it. Again, based on whatever type case it is, it's going to determine what it is that we're looking for on the vehicle. Anybody else? I have a question. So, um, you know, the, the nature of your work, you're kind of dealing with something like the worst elements of humanity. Like, how do you and your team kind of like manage that stress and, you know, kind of working in the mud as much as you do? That's a big thing for us, actually, mental health. Uh, actually, for law enforcement as a whole, mental health is becoming more and more of a concern for everyone involved because you do, you see the worst of the worst and you see it every day. Um, in my unit, what we do is we're very flexible. Um, if someone calls, comes to me and just says, you know what, I gotta go. I'm like, go, you know, that's fine. Go do what you need to do, walk around, uh, clear your mind. If you need to watch a television show, we have television in all of our offices. If you need to sit down and watch, you know, a funny show or something like that, just to kind of re, direct your mind a little bit where you are. We, we're certainly open to that. We uh, actually meet with psychiatrists once a year. Uh, that's part of a mandatory for the crimes against children. Um, so if you do have something that's going on, we certainly want to deal with that as quickly as we possibly can. Um, it, it is, I mean, there's different techniques and we train on that. I mean, we have a lot of training. There's a shift wellness that deals with just child pornography and they have different speakers that come out. Uh, there's ways to run the unit. Like I said, with the flexibility, uh, we talk to each other a lot. I was telling you we're an awesome group, and that's one of the reasons. We're a very, very close-knit group. So if you need to go, you may not feel comfortable talking to a family member or a friend about something that you're working on or something that you've seen. It's easier to talk to someone who experiences the same thing that you experience, and that way, once you can express it, talk about it, and get it out, then it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So that work environment, I mean, that is, it's very, very good in that way. Uh, the GBI is very strong in mental health, not only with this, but in a lot of ways. So there's, there's a lot of people that are paying attention to that. <laughs>